Well, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's joined us here today. We are going to talk today about renewable energy or green energy for data centers. I think at the moment internationally, uh, private PPAs and especially data centers are one of the fastest growing and most interesting customers or corporate customers for renewable energy IPPs and uh, so independent power producers and developers. So I think this is a very important topic we are, we are discussing today. And we have with us as well um, three speakers who are going to be uh, telling us their know-how in, in this specific topic. And they are from really important companies in the area. So we have with us, and I'd like uh, for you guys to invite you to introduce yourselves, uh, Maria and Joan from Microsoft. Could you please introduce yourselves? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Jimena Cordova. I work for Microsoft Energy and Sustainability team. Um, I'm a project manager here and cover many of the regions within the Americas, North and South America. Thank you very much. John? Hey, folks. My name is Joan Chu. I'm also on the energy sustainability team. Um, I am part of the sub team within the team that's responsible for procuring renewables. Um, and both of us are based out of Redmond, Washington, which is right outside of Seattle. Excellent. Thank you very much. What about you, Colin? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Colin Smith. I'm a senior analyst for Wood McKenzie based in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, my focus in area of analysis is um, formerly in the, the solar sector, but at the large scale, simply the energy transition over to renewables, particularly by that of large corporations. Well, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your introduction. And uh, I mean, many of you have already been in our webinars before. We'd like to go to the point, you know, this is just under one hour. So um, what we have is a, a presentation from Joan and Maria first, and then we'll have a presentation from, from Colin. Did I get that right? No, it's the other way around. Sorry about that. <laughs> Colin, you go first, and then we'll have Joan and Maria. Sorry about that, like momentarily. And, uh, and after that, you can send us your questions and we'll take them at the end. So every time we do a very similar structure. So Colin, I'm gonna invite you to share your screen with us. And once you do that, I just like to remind you all that we are going to have um, a recordings and also the materials for this webinar. And you will be sent a link where you can download everything. Uh, Colin, go ahead uh, if you wanna prepare your screen. And um, I just like to say also, um, you know, welcome to all of you. I see there are people from the UK, from Ireland, from India, from Qatar even. So British person in Qatar, Brazil, uh, Germany, um, people are also here in Madrid. So welcome everyone. I know that, you know, where you are, it might be very late, very early. So we appreciate you being here today, but I think the topic is very important for us to discuss. Colin, I can see your presentation perfectly. Go ahead. Terrific. Um, so my goal here today was really to set the stage for everyone on where I see the renewable sector going. Um, I'm particularly focusing on the U.S., but this is a transition that we really are seeing globally um, and a trend that we're seeing across um, the, you know, multiple countries um, driven by some of the very same um, statistics and, and um, economic and political factors that we're seeing in the United States. Where I wanted to sort of start us off with, hold on, is just looking at the total U.S. electricity energy demand. Um, if we break that down, roughly 70% of all electricity demand is coming from the commercial and industrial sector. So from a very broad perspective, um, what we're seeing is that you know, well over two thirds of all energy demand is coming from these very large groups that have very high um, you know, electricity needs. As time is going on and as companies are more and more shifting to dealing with climate change and political pressures and um, various other renewable portfolio standards. Um, they're also sort of changing their energy infrastructure. Um, through this, what we're seeing is the massive adaptation of particularly wind and solar energy and more and more so uh, battery storage as well. To look at this from sort of a demand perspective, one of the things we did most recently was basically to take the estimated total current power demand um, of the Fortune 1000, a somewhat representative share in some respects of the entire US C&I sector to look at you know, what exactly was the demand, how much of that was being met for renewables, um, and what was the sort of adaptation in the fast pace. 
what we found is that we've really only barely scratched the surface of meeting the total Fortune 1000 electricity demand. But the reality is the vast majority of these companies um, year over year are expressing increased interest in more and more renewables because it's lowering overall costs and it's helping them to meet green targets. The main factors that are really driving this um, ultimately, if we leave policy and climate change entirely off the table, is the fact that wind and solar costs are really have declined dramatically. Um, if we look at the levelized cost of electricity on the left back in 2010, we can see that you know onshore wind and utility solar were you know over two times the cost of gas combined cycle plants. Um, today, what we're seeing is in kind of a in sort of the, the 2020 range is that um, utility solar beats out uh, or sort of on par beating out um, uh, virtually all uh, gas combined cycles um, and in many territories beating out onshore wind. One of the other factors that we look at too is something we call co net cone, the cost of new entry. So is the actual revenue that a company procuring or um, owning their own solar or wind system um, greater than the cost of actually adding a new, new system. In any you know, simple math terms, um, you would want your revenue to be exceeding uh, the actual net cost and to provide benefit to you as the company. What we see in the long run is that as the production tax credit for wind in the United States is stepping down based on pure economics, um, solar is tending to beat out wind in virtually most territories. Um, and despite wind's very low price, what we're seeing happening more and more frequently um, is that there's simply congestion issues in, in particular state markets too. If we look at actually the net numbers of what's been happening too, um, we see a pretty dramatic trend. So if we look at the, the total net amount of utility solar and wind that have been being procured by either directly or indirectly by large corporations and industrial companies, um, 2015 or earlier, um, it was about 6.2 gigawatts. Um, in 2016, that was about 1.7, almost doubled in 2017. You know, 2018 is a, it's been increasing year over year, and then in 2019 we've beaten that record again. And so what's happening is we're seeing this tremendous move that's actually, you know, the the economic factors we outlined earlier is now we're actually seeing it happening in real time. The contracts by these large companies that are being signed more and more companies are actually buying solar and wind energy and moving towards being powered entirely by green electrons. If we start looking at who these companies are and what some of the dynamics are too, what we can see is there's a very interesting pattern. Um, the vast majority of these companies are technology and data firms like Microsoft. Um, they're companies that have very large energy loads to a specific um, type of building, a data center. Um, but to quickly pivot away from that into you know, the rising race, um, there's a group called the RE100, corporations that have pledged to meeting 100% uh, clean energy or zero carbon targets. Year over year over year, we see the number of corporations doing this increasing. Um, and besides the companies who've actually made the pledge, we've seen many others uh, make promises and goals that they're moving towards quite aggressively. And beyond that, too, not only are we seeing a rise in the number of new entrants into the market, but we're seeing a rise in the number of repeat buyers into the market. So not only are new companies coming in to buy wind and solar for the first time, but we're seeing more and more companies actually procuring additional projects um, after having done one or two or multiple projects before that. Um, but quickly back to, to data centers and one of the main topics we're, we're here to discuss today. Um, these technology and data firms, although you know, data centers aren't the entire cause of the energy um, demand for power of this type, um, they're a very large portion of it. Um, data centers typically use between 20% um, and 87% more electricity per square foot than a comparable building. So they're driving a tremendous amount of the demand that we're seeing. And typically what we're seeing as well is that not only is that part of, partly responsible for the reason that that demographic is so highly represented um, by energy procurement companies, um, but it's also one of the reasons that they're driving some of the largest projects that we're seeing. So the, in, we took this data primarily towards the uh, sort of the beginning of 2019, but at that point in time, roughly the technology and data center average system size was closer to 100 megawatts. 
If you compare that to sort of the industrial sector, including manufacturing and other um, and um, other raw system co system uh, uh, processing, it's um, you know half that at 51 megawatts. Retail services are about at 42, so we're talking companies like Target, um, uh, IKEA, Walmart, etc. Um, and healthcare is a slowly emerging sector of it um, as well. And ultimately, where is this all going? What we see is the CNI sector is actually driving what is a major portion of the U.S. renewable energy market at this point. Um, historically, on the wind side, it's driven you know anywhere between 25 and 45 percent of all procurements by volume in a given year. On the solar side, we're now at 25 percent of projects in development have some sort of corporate off taker. So we're, we're not only just talking about how corporations are transitioning into this, but we're talking about how corporations like this are actually shaping the entire U.S. electricity market um, going forward. By about 2024, I don't have this graph in front of you, but uh, by 2024, utility solar in the United States will, um, there'll be more utility solar community capacity additions than hydro, coal, natural gas, and all other carbon sources combined. So in terms of what new generation is being added to the grid, solar with wind in addition to it, both onshore and offshore, um, renewables are absolutely going to beat out carbon sources. If you look at the graph in front of you, what you can kind of see is that, you know, by the mid-2020s, we're seeing, you know, four or five gigawatts of annual um, uh, cumulative capacity addition of renewables. Um, you know, this is more than, you know, 2 point, or 4.2, 4.5 that we'll see in 2023, 2024 is more power than we saw come online for the entire United States in 2015 from a utility solar standpoint. What we're seeing is this demand and drive is actually pushing a tremendous amount of new energy onto the grid, um, which will be a, a very interesting transition. And lastly, the one thing I'll add is many, much of the focus I've talked about here today is really looking at large-scale procurement. But the reality is there's a tremendously vast number of ways that which corporations can actually procure energy. Um, there's front-of-the-meter procurement, buying uh, power from very large um, uh, power, solar and wind power plants um, that are miles away. There's what's called distributed, um, many of you know about, which is typically on-site and behind the meter. We're now getting into more and more merchant projects, actually corporations being able to buy renewable energy on the wholesale market. And many more utilities are also offering what are often termed green tariffs, deals that simply allow the utility to provide a much higher level of renewable penetration to a commercial off taker than would be normal. So the last note I'll leave you with before transitioning off is to say that this transition that I've outlined is something that absolutely we're seeing happening very rapidly, but the methods by which it happened will be very diverse and we'll see a tremendous amount of not only uh, new projects being added, but new um, uh, contractual and financial engineering to meet these goals, um, and a lot of creativity sort of coming in and innovation in order for these companies to really hit um, these targets of often 100% or net zero carbon or in many cases negative carbon impact. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Joan and Maria. Thank you very much, Colin. If I may ask you to just, uh, perfect, thank you, you go ahead of time. Joan Maria, this is your time now. If you can just put your presentation up and when you're ready. And we have a few questions already. We'll get to them um, right after the presentations are done. But I, I think we're, we're going to have plenty of time to go through them. Right? We can see it perfectly. Go ahead. Perfect. One second, sir. Okay. Well, thank you, Colin, for that presentation. Um, so what Joan and I are going to do is just talk a little bit about how we procure power for our data centers here. Let's, let me start with, uh, one sec. Yeah, now it's working. Let, let me start with this uh, picture that shows, probably not a lot of people have been with, within a data center building. So I wanted to start with this. And this is how a normal or typical data center looks like. It's just a bunch of, servers and computers uh, housed in a, in, a, in a big building. And, and what we're seeing is the world is just like 
turning to a future that is even more and more and more based on cloud computing. These data centers are the backbone of those services. This is where all the cloud computing services are run into, where all the information is stored and processed. And as these uh, services become more and more and more important for everyone, for personal and business uses, what we see is a bunch of uh, public issues that are arising and emerging. And one of those issues is energy and sustainability of data centers. So that's what our team does. We've uh, spent a lot of time just uh, thinking about what's our role within the energy uh, supply chain and what we can do. So what um, I'm gonna do and John is gonna do is just share where we are at Microsoft, what we've done and what our commitments are going forward. Um, this uh, slide shows our footprint. Uh, so as you can see, this is a global, global business um, with significant infrastructure behind it. So we have what we call Azure regions. So Azure is the Microsoft Cloud. So we have 60, uh, 56 right now Azure regions around the globe. We have presence in 140 countries and the way in more than 100 data centers. Those, those, those buildings that I just showed in the prior, in the prior slide. So as, you, as the way we, we want to think about this is that we're building a data utility. So the, the similar to, to a, a power and electricity utility. Now what we have is this, so the dots uh, represent the data centers and they are all interconnected and data is being transported. Um, uh, or these data centers communicate uh, with, with one another. Uh, so this is what we're building. Um, some people are more familiar with Microsoft products. So we have uh, here in the, in the middle, Microsoft Azure. But if you think about your, your daily lives, we have OneDrive, Outlook, Skype, Teams, Xbox Live, Exchange, Bing. So th these products, if we don't realize sometimes, but all these products and software just run on those data centers that we were talking about. And, and we have so many users and traffic that every day the, the usage and the utilization of the, of the data center is just bigger and bigger. So what does it mean? It means that power is a key ingredient for this operation. So we, um, uh, we see power as a key, or it's become, and we see it as a key component of, of the operation of Microsoft Cloud. And, and of course, uh, as the cloud business and, and services grow, this um, also becomes a, a, a big responsibility for a company like Microsoft. So we not only need to make sure that there is power available and, and, and sufficient for, for the operations, but we are, of course, a big, big a large um, power user and therefore we take that responsibility very, very, very seriously. Um, one important thing to note is that even though the data centers themselves and the operations grow, uh, they, this type of hyperscale data centers are much more energy efficiency and energy efficient than the individual server and data centers that each um, customer may have in their own premises or facilities. And, and that happens not only because of economies of scale, but also because for a company like Microsoft, the, the cloud is a, a core competency. And therefore we spend a significant resources and we do a lot of uh, research and development to make sure that we drive towards energy efficiency. So although the, the usage of, 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 of data centers has grown significantly over the past few years, the total um, power consumption over the past few years have remained um, relatively stable. Um, so what specifically uh, we're focusing on in the en energy sector? So we, we'd like to, to put that in, in under these three um, areas. 
So the first area is we want to make sure that we uh, generate clean energy for our operations. And Joan is going to talk about that in more, in more detail. Two, we want to make sure that we um, are enabling and contributing to new generation technologies or new energy or the generation of new te uh, energy technologies in all the markets we operate. And, and lastly, that we bring new solutions to the markets we operate in. And that means new business models, new technologies, new um, relationships with utilities, and all that just to bring, um, it to, to help develop the markets we work on and to help um, move towards a low, low carbon future. Let me now just uh, share a couple of, of projects, examples that, that we've done in the, in, in the past. So this first one is in Cheyenne, Wyoming, here in the US. Um, so we have um, data centers over there and we have a, a significant operation. So a few years back, um, when we were planning our growth in the region, um, we started conversations with the utility in, 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 in and started planning for this load that was gonna uh, hit their market. Um, they told us initially, okay, yes, we can serve you, no problem, but we'll need to add generation to the grid to be able to do that. Then on the other side, um, as you can imagine, uh, for our data centers, we need like almost 100% reliability or power availability all the time, like 99.999% nine, of the time. So what we usually do in our data centers is have backup generation. So in addition to being connected to the utility grid, we have our own backup generation. A lot of the times that back gen backup generation is diesel, it's based on diesel. So it was like, okay, the utility is gonna um, build this new generation to be able to serve uh, our data centers. And we're gonna install that same capacity in backup generation. So it didn't look like the, the, the smartest solution uh, from an energy perspective. So what we, um, agreed to do on the structure was to um, use a backup generation based on natural gas um, that was going to be better than the, the coal generation that init was initially planned by the by the utility and uh, that those um, those uh, natural gas generators um, became part of, of the utilities um, total generation and their planning. So the way it works is we are basically on call and, and the utility can call us anytime for, to provide uh, peak generation for the grid. So it was a win-win for everyone. There was no need to du duplicate the, the, the generation um, capacity that we needed. Um, the natural gas was a, 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 a more environmentally friendly solution that, than, than coal. And this just shows how we um, try to approach our relationships with utilities. So we wanna find solutions. This is just one example of, in, in, in which um, both uh, the utility customers and Microsoft benefit from. And, and lastly, let me share another, another example. Uh, so recently, also in the US, in the PJM market, um, we ran a pilot uh, project uh, that's an energy, energy storage project uh, for one of, of, of our data centers in the region. So what we were seeing is that not, since we need that level of reliability in our data centers, <clears throat> a lot of the times we have underutilized generation, backup generation or, or storage. And at the same time, and, 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 and not only PJM, but, and, but different grids, we see more intermittency in, in utility grids. And the utility is trying to <clears throat> make investments in, in in to try to manage the, the, the introduction of more, of more and more renewable energy. So 
we had underutilized assets. The utility was, um, the grid was more intermittent. So we were trying, we, were, we saw an opportunity there. So the question is, what can we do? How can we uh, help? Or how can we ensure that operation is reliable, but not put extra pressure on the, on the grid? So what we did last year was a pilot um, uh, an energy storage and the, the objective of the pilot was to basically have a um, battery that charges during off peak hours and then discharges on peak hours. And the objective is just to what we call load, load shifting. So it's just try to reduce our, our impact on the peak hours of the grid. So this, this has a lot of um, benefits for, for the grid and for us. So for the grid, it's obviously less, uh, it's a lower need for, for peak uh, generation, which we all know is more expensive and a lot of the times it's based on fuel and fossil fuels. And for us, it's also less um, generation on those peak hours that are the most expensive of, of the day. Uh, so that's a pilot that we run. Uh, we are moving with a different pilot now that will use artificial intelligence to try to hit the hours of the, of the day in which the peaks are, are, are the highest. And then we are also going to pilot um, frequency regulation services for the grid, um, kind of um, integrated with our data centers. Um, so these were just like a couple of examples of what, what, what we're doing. Now let me turn it over to Joan, which is, who is going to go into our more of the renewable energy piece and our commitments uh, going forward. Thank you, Maria. Um, all right. Hi, folks. Um, before I go into our renewable energy programs, and we're I'm we're representing our data center energy and sustainability team. So um, most of our work is focused on procuring electricity and renewables for our data centers. Um, so I kind of want to zoom out to the company level to sort of cover um, to sort of. I'm oh, sorry. I should go to the next slide. Um, just to talk a little bit touch a little bit on why Microsoft is doing this. So um, I think Colin touched on it a little bit, um, but if you look at graphs about CNI customers, particularly data centers and um, the LCOE of renewables and the cost of renewables, it might lead you to think that data centers need electricity and renewables will be able to provide that electricity cheaply. That is not really the case. Um, renewables is cost competitive in certain markets, but not uniformly across around the world. Um, and Microsoft is doing this because um, there are a number of reasons why Microsoft is doing this, but the main reason is because it's the right thing to do. Um, Maria touched on this in her examples and when she talked about power be, being the primary feedstock of data centers. The data center team, we think of ourselves as part of the energy value chain. When you think about, when you think about electrons flowing uh, through the grid and into our data centers, we're essentially taking those electrons and refining it into content. So we're actually as much part of the energy value chain as, um, as a wind farm might be. So we think of ourselves as citizens of the energy value chain and we have a responsibility to do the right thing for the energy industry. Um, so the, this webinar actually comes at a really great time because a few weeks ago, our CEO, our CFO and our president all got up and announced a really ambitious climate plan for Microsoft to be by 2030 carbon negative and to by 2050 remove all of the carbon that we've emitted into the environment either directly or through our electrical consumption um, since we were founded in 1975. So this announcement, uh, while it was really ambitious, our, our focus on sustainability is actually not new. Uh, Microsoft has been tracking and reducing our carbon emissions since 2007 and we've actually been operating our, we've been carbon neutral since 2012. 
Um, we were actually one of the first companies to implement an in internal carbon fee on our scope one and our scope two emissions, which is actually a, a very powerful incentive for us internally to actually go and find carbon saving alternatives and invest in renewables and things like that. So as part of the announcement that Microsoft made a few weeks ago, um, as I mentioned, uh, the primary one is that Microsoft will be carbon negative by 2030. Uh, we'll remove all of our, uh, we'll remove all of the carbon that we've emitted uh, by, 20, by 2050. Um, we plan to aggressively cut our carbon emissions by more than half by 2030 from both our direct emissions and for our entire supply and value chain. Um, by 2025, we will shift to 100% a supply of renewable energy. Uh, and, then the, and then we will also reduce our scope three emissions by more than half by 2030 through a series of measures. Um, the internal carbon, the internal carbon fee that I mentioned for scope one and two emissions will also be extended to cover scope three emissions for all business units. This means that when a business unit is actually reporting their expenses, they have to book a line that says this is how much their carbon expense was, and they have to, they actually have to do an internal, uh, they have to pay for that internally. Um, by 2030, we will remove all, more carbon than we emit, and it'll set us on a path to remove all of our historical carbon emissions. As part of the broader announcement, as I mentioned, uh, we, are, we are increasing our renewables goal from, our last one was actually 70% by 2023. Um, we've committed to doing 100% renewables by 2025. And what this actually means is for every megawatt hour of load that Microsoft consumes, we will procure a megawatt hour of additional renewable energy through power purchase agreements, green tariffs, and other procurement mechanisms. Um, since we signed our first power purchase agreement in 2013, and since then, we've signed, we've announced uh, about two gigawatts of incremental renewable capacity in, in grids around the world. So this is just some of the deals that we've signed into our portfolio. Um, we've done deals all around the world. We've done a lot of standalone solar, standalone wind. Um, our portfolio also includes, for instance, a solar rooftop portfolio in Singapore. Um, offshore in the Netherlands, um, and a solar wind hybrid portfolio in Texas. Um, and obviously this portfolio is going to grow over the next few years as we, as we march toward our 100% goal by 2025. And you'll probably see this map looking a lot more like the Azure data center map that Maria showed at the very beginning. So that's all I had. And yeah. And I think it's turn it over to the crowd for questions. Thank you very much, Joan. Actually, I want to ask you just to take it off so that we can see you because then the, the, the cameras become larger on the speakers. Fantastic. We have a lot of questions, as you can see down there, but I'd like to start with one of my own. Uh, and um, one of the things with energy is that uh, is not necessarily reduced, especially when it's variable renewable at the time that is consumed. And you said to, okay, if we consume one megawatt hour, then we will, you know, procure one megawatt hour of renewable energy as well. But it's not really the same reducing a megawatt hour at a, a one point or it doesn't cost the same as in another, essentially. So my question is whether you're looking into dispatchability solutions or, you know, actually being able, you talked a little bit about load shifting, but in, in being able to get that energy when you want it, because there is also, you know, uh, renewable energies that you can procure and you, they can work a little bit more like batteries. So I'm just wondering whether you guys are moving in that direction at all? Yeah, we, we are definitely moving in that direction. So when we're procuring a megawatt hour for a megawatt hour that we consume, we're, we're looking at it on an annual basis. Um, so we're not looking at it on an hourly basis. 
However, we are, there are initiatives for us to do that more often um, because we do ultimately care about the carb taking carbon off of the grid. So we have to think about the, the, um, the complete consequences of all of our decisions. Yeah, my, my point is like, you know, procuring like photovoltaic energy, say, you know, like 12 o'clock, you know, noon is very, very cheap, you know, almost zero, you know, the cost of that energy, not zero, but like it's really low. And, but that doesn't mean that, you know, that if you need energy from gas at like 8 p.m., you know, it's the same. It's also a lot more expensive. So it's one of yeah. those things. Colin, you seem like you wanted to add something because you were like, I'm muting yourself. Do you want to add something? We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. How about now? Now, yes. Sorry about that. Um, no, I, I, it's, I think in, in part of it we're talking about, I was a little bit alluded to this at the end, um, there's going to be absolutely multiple avenues by which this happens. I think, you know, there's going to be load shifting. Um, I think we're going to see batteries also being used for other uses such as um, uh, transmission upgrade deferrals and or time of use and frequency regulation, which also will help save on costs and allow more costs to be invested elsewhere. Um, I think one of the, the big factors in terms of, you know, solar energy being cheap and at noon and not being able to be used at 8 p.m. at night um, is something that is going to happen. And, and load shifting with sort of battery storage is, is one, all, one possibility of that. Um, but as I mentioned, we're, we're going to see multiple avenues by which you're going to be able to tackle a lot of these problems, uh, whether or not be through, um, you know, better transmission, through high voltage DC transmission lines long term or other long term solutions that can actually provide solutions that are not quite ready yet. Um, renewables and battery storage do have their limits. And a lot of what we're talking about here today ultimately surrounds the question of, what are the limits and how do we still hit these goals within the limits of what the technology is today and how can we push that technology a little bit further in the future? Totally. I was actually at a, at a grid event uh, last week in Sacramento. And uh, one of the things is all of these utilities were there, you know, very senior people from the, the western part of, of the U.S. And everyone is like, of course, we're doing renewables. We love renewables and they are super cheap and, you know, we love that stuff. But there is really at the moment not a lot of mechanisms to value all that it is like base load renewable production, which is very different, you know, from just like variable production, because it's more expensive and there is no mechanisms to account for that. And I'm talking particularly about this technology called concentrated solar power, which can either just produce 24 seven, you know, continuously, or we can produce at night, you know, because you use very cheap PV at day. And it's impossible to make it work because yeah, everyone wants to do renewable that is cheap, but that, that you cannot value it because there is gas, you know, and there is coal and there is this other stuff. You know, yeah, I don't, I don't want to procure that. So, you know, this was what, where my question came from. It's actually because I was last week there and I realized that the problem is everyone recognizes the need for it. Just no one seems to have enough stacking of value to be able to say, yes, we're willing to pay for this at this moment. Anyway, it was just one of those comments. All right, so there is a lot of comments here about cooling guys. Obviously, you need a lot of cooling and your data centers. Are you using any mechanisms for that? Uh, how do you do it? And uh, are you willing to even invest into that sort of technology? Because there is renewable cooling uh, and it could be developed further. Yeah, we definitely use a lot of cooling. So the way uh, we measure our energy consumption is what we use for IT, which is the actual servers, the computing, plus cooling and others like offices and, and everything. I'm not familiar with the, with the technologies, uh, so I'm not able to speak a lot about that. But what I can say is that um, we have teams that are dedicated only to make sure that we drive towards more energy efficient cooling and in general um, uh, consumption in our data centers. We have a, a measure for that that we call PUE, and that it just tells us uh, for each data center specifically how efficient um, are we in the, in the use of, of energy, and that includes cooling as, as one of the main components. 
um, over the past few years, our PUEs for, for most of our data centers have gone down uh, significantly. So we've done like a, like a lot of progress and there is a lot of more progress to be to be made in, in, in that in that area. Thank you very much. I mean, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Do you want to add anything, John? No. no? I suppose Colin also, unless you have knowledge. Um, I'm just, that way I don't have much, much knowledge of sort of cooling technologies. <laughs> it is one of those things, isn't it? Because what we do is we like just plug the electricity in, but there is better ways to do it and uh, you know what is needed. Particularly, the, you know, in the UAE and those areas, they're like working a lot on that kind of stuff. All right, so I am, I'm going through the questions here. And there was one that I wanted to answer, but now I can't find it. So just one second. Okay. Um, there was one about you saying that you want to remove all those carbon footprints, you know, like this announcement, this large announcement that was made from the beginning of Microsoft, which I think is really courageous. Uh, luckily, also, Microsoft is not a very carbon intensive company. You know, if you were a cement producer, it would be a, a, a very different thing. But uh, the question is, are you guys looking into any carbon reduction technologies or carbon uh, capturing technologies, you know, anything like that, or is just maybe over investing in renewables in order to remove more of that, uh, the fossil fuel power? So, so part of the answer to removing carbon from the grid um, is, is renewables. Um, the other, the other part of it is uh, as part of, or I'll come into the, the lens a little bit more. Um, the other, the other part of it is um, as part, as part of our uh, carbon announcement last month, we also announced a $1 billion climate fund. And so that climate fund is debt will be dedicated to funding research or um, technologies, R&D and technologies that um, that have the potential to reduce carbon. Um, so we obviously have technologies in mind like carbon capture and, and things like that. Um, but we'll be looking at those on a case by case basis through and investing in those through 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 our, through our investment fund. Actually, there's a person here that asks, um, if I'm not mistaken, to supply 100 megawatt data centers with 100% renewable energy and energy storage would in the gigawatt hour range would be needed. So you would need like you know storage on the gigawatt hour range, which is not really available today. Do you think this could be handled by batteries? So he's asking about, you know, your goals, like your, your milestones and whether you can actually, do you think you can actually do it with current technology? So is the question, is the question whether we can like take our data center offline and just have to be able to? Yes, yes, um, that, that's the gist of it, yes. Yeah, so we are looking at, we are looking at energy storage uh, backup system um, but I don't think our intention would be to completely be able to take the data center offline. The, I mean, the grid itself provides is a valuable resource. And for us to develop a data center that's completely able to unplug from the, the grid, um, I think, like I said, like we think of ourselves as citizens of the energy value chain and for us to just kind of operate in isolation is kind of goes against that. Yeah, so one of the questions, the other questions is, are you looking at uh, the centralized, uh, being decentralized or to centralize the process of energy generation? It's a bit like, so meaning like, for example, would you be a player in the actually energy distribution or, or transmission? Would you generate in one place and carry to other data centers? Or would you just generate in each of the places where you have your data centers? The way we we do it today, and and we'll uh, I think keep doing it is, we do not need to generate in the same location where we're located in exactly the same location. Of course, we want to be as as close as possible to to a good source of of power generation, and in that needs the least amount of new transmission lines or distribution lines, but we do not it's impossible for all of our data centers to be just right next to a hydro plant or, or whatever that is, or a nu nuclear plant or whatever that is. They're, called, they're virtual, virtual PPAs, essentially, where you know, there's been an exchange of energy, understood. Okay, uh, there's one question for you here, Colin. Let me see if I find it. I'm going up and down because we have 18 opening questions and people keep on sending more. 
<laughs> Do good wind energy projections include the accelerated expansion of the U.S. offshore wind power? So, great question. Um, no, they do not. Um, U.S. offshore wind power is going to grow quite dramatically over the next several years. Um, it is, offshore wind power isn't something that's been tapped into directly yet by um, corporate and industrial companies um, for direct procurement. Um, so, from that standpoint, I left it out of the analysis I, I showed you earlier. Um, but if we're talking, you know, from a national standpoint or an international standpoint about how renewables, including offshore wind, will be growing and, and supplying companies uh, like Microsoft, absolutely that will be included. Um, offshore wind is something that is, um, in many respects, very difficult, um, if, especially in places like, um, for a classic example, California, where um, right off the California coast, it gets very deep very quickly. So the ability to actually build a wind turbine that is rooted in the seabed is quite difficult. Um, the technology is to, to do that is simply called a floating wind turbine where you're anchored by tethers to the, the, the seabed way down below, but the bulk of the system is actually a floating uh, platform. Um, as more and more of these systems get developed and we see the, the cost come down, um, we're going to see it become more and more accessible to more and more regions of the world and we'll see offshore wind grow quite tremendously. Excellent. This one question also for uh, Maria and Joan. What storage technologies are you considering uh, for your data centers? So what kind of technologies, or however you want to answer that? Um, so I, I can't really speak to this because I'm not the, the right person, but I, I do believe we're looking at like a number of like lithium ion and other types of energy storage technologies. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I, I can imagine that is a very technical question. You know, have people like clicking the numbers going, how many hours do we need? You know, what are we doing in this data center? So, <laughs> you know, like I, almost every time you consider a different data center, you would have to like run a different model. So it's a very hard question to answer, but I'm sure, you know, there is like a number of, just looking at what Bill Gates, you know, has invested on in terms of storage technologies. He has money in a lot of different uh, ventures, you know, and all the ranges of the technologies, but also at different levels of the development. So I imagine it goes yeah. around the same way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, that's, the, that's the way we look at technology as well. We don't, we're not going to pick a specific technology. We're looking at things on a case by case basis. And um, like with a virtual PPA, Microsoft is taking a position in a long term position in, in an energy market, and we are left with that position. Um, so we're looking at everything on a case by case basis in terms of how much it'll cost, how much risk it presents to the company, et cetera. Thank you very much. Okay, let me ask you just one last question and then Colin, take a look. If you see any questions there that you'd like to answer, then you can go for it because there's so many open. You know, every time I close one, there's another one open. So, um, and it's like, what is like at, at present, the total uh, installed capacity that you have in renewables in all of, you know, considering all of your data centers? Uh, we've announced uh, just under two gigawatts in our portfolio. Okay, so a, a lot more to come, I'm sure. In the next few years, you guys are going to be very busy uh, procuring a lot of new energy. Mm -hmm. We're definitely accelerating our pace. Yeah, I think this is just, a, a, you know, my own personal evaluation that is good that technology companies, you know, are taking this sort of position and because they're kicking renewables, the utilities into gear, into, you know, innovate, or otherwise suffer the consequences. So it's good because I think in a perfect working market where utilities were providing that service, you wouldn't have to do it, but you have to do it because it's not there. So it's good that, you know, companies like Microsoft are taking the lead and saying, we're going down this route and giving these really clear signals to the markets. So we all know, you know, what's going on. I think, you know, you guys like on my side, you know, I'm really happy in here. There is markets like the U.S. that are already quite um, competitive, and then there is other markets, you know, like I'm not going to name names, actually, you know, it's bad <laughs> forms, where, you know, where I'm just wishing for those PPAs to come through because I'm like, you know, certain utilities need to be told if you don't up your game, you're going to be out before you know it. You know, in 10 years, you're irrelevant. So anyway, I just wanted to say my piece since you guys are there. And Colin, did you take a look at the questions that you want to answer one specifically or same for you guys, uh -huh. by the way? 
No, I, I kind of was more just in, intent on listening to, to Joan and Maria, but um, I, you know, if there's there's any other questions that you can think of, I'm, I'm happy to, to chime in as well. I know it's, it's certainly been a lot of topics we could dive in, we could spend hours chatting about here today. Let's talk about just one more thing. I love talking about this, by the way. You know, like like people, my friends are like sick of hearing me talk about it. But the, one of the, the things that I wanted to, I know you guys started in the U.S. and it's good for that because it makes things a lot easier. You have it's just the regular, well, depends where in the U.S. as well, but like the regulations are a lot more, um, they have a lot more area for innovation, say, whereas, you know, in Europe, we have a lot more like structure. I mean, I'm sure you guys suffer this all the time. Um, but I suppose my next question would be like, okay, what markets are you in now? What markets are next and which are next in terms of? in terms of procurement of these sort of renewables. And I'm talking about international markets, actually. I think, honestly, what I've told you now is no mystery to anyone that is attending this webinar. You know, we're all wishing for the push, you know, uh, for the, the, the private procurement, because otherwise, utility comp companies are way too comfy, you know, and protected by the government. So is, can you tell us about your markets, essentially? Um, yeah, if you... If you just look at the Azure regions map for Microsoft, those are all the regions that we're interested in. And we're probably interested in regions beyond what's on that map. So I really can't think of any countries that we're not interested in. Um, yeah. Yeah, but but you, you're making a really good point. So as, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of the renewable work that we've done has been in the US and in Europe as well. Um, and that has to do a lot with, with where our loads are and our biggest presence is. But that's changing considerably, not only for Microsoft, but for all technology companies. Yeah. So going forward, um, we expect to see like a lot more development, say in South America, Africa. We already have one region over there, Asia. Uh, it's gonna become like more, it's, it's growing uh, significantly as well. So I, I would say that the easy markets are already kind of in the in the picture uh, from both Azure and renewables. And now we're gonna start moving towards the most the developing countries or, or less developed uh, energy markets as well. Um, if the GDPR is anything is like the, the the protection, the data protection um, law here in Europe is anything to go by. You know, it's very, what is happening now and the European Union usually is the first one they advance, but there is a lot of copy pasting going on with these sort of laws where they say, no, the data centers with the data for my people, you have them on my territory. And the minute that that happens, your job becomes like a lot more complicated um, mm -hmm. and you, you are required. But there are countries where they can't even potentially, you know, secure that you have the access to that energy. So definitely you're going to have to, to do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're pretty much out of time. I'd just like to thank you very much. For me, this is, as I said, you know, a very fascinating topic, something that I've been following for a long time. Um, and uh, calling, seeing your numbers, you know, um, amazing and great to, to see all that intelligence and all that analysis going in there. Case of Joan and, and Maria, you know, uh, thank you very much for your work and please keep Keep them coming, you know. I mean, I think the energy industry does need uh, that sort of push, you know, or renewable energy, should I say, in order for us to be able to advance because it's just not enough, you know, at the moment. Going by IDINA uh, and the IEA and everyone's measures, we need to get a lot faster in deployment of renewable energies in order to control that 1.5, well, forget 1.5, say 2 degrees uh, heating. We already need to be installing 10 times more renewable energy every day than we currently are. And I don't really see a lot of like, I mean, yes, the renewable energy, you know, deployment is going up, but it's going up a lot slower than it needs to. So it's good, you know, that we're putting that pressure there for companies to, and especially utilities and companies that have a lot to lose if they don't uh, in that way. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I'd like to thank all of our audience uh, very much for their time, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.